Well, welcome one and all to worship here at Three Chop Presbyterian Church. We are glad and excited to be worshiping here today together on this good day. We have uh, several things going on by way of announcements this afternoon, right after the service, of course. We're going to have our called congregational meeting to uh, finish up a few items that were uh, slated on the table for from the uh, annual meeting. Um, also, just a, a short note and report on our officers' retreat this past weekend. Uh, your officers, your leadership, your deacons and elders were worshiping and meeting and collecting and getting together this past weekend, Friday and Saturday, uh, to listen to each other, to inspire each other, to hear the pulse of the church, and to look at what is going to be coming for us in the coming years. We're all wrapping our heads around the changes and shifts that have gone on in the past couple of years that we all are certainly familiar with. So we're proud and, and pleased to be joining together in that and in support of them. They're going to be spending this coming week in prayer over the church and over their ministries together. This coming Wednesday, there is a Cornerstone Bible uh, study program. We call it Bible study, but it's also uh, a wonderful time to come together and have lunch. So you can read more about that in the newsletter as well as a spring cleaning day that's coming on April 1st. That is not a joke. It is intentional. We are going to do it. We're going to be here doing the outside cleaning and gardening. It's a, it's a great time to get together and, and dig around in the dirt together. Also, uh, Alleluia Fest. Uh, Mr. Ben was, was so sadly sick. He's back now in action, but we are postponing and have postponed Alleluia Fest uh, to the 12th. So if you're looking forward to that great intergenerational moment where we can come together and celebrate this season of Lent, that is going to be happening on the 12th. Well, lastly, I just wanted to also mention, uh, the, uh, we've been talking about our justice ministry here at the church uh, off and on for several months now, and uh, we've got an excellent committed core of folks who are participating in um, justice ministry in the city, and the way we're expressing that is through our collaboration with RISC, which is a local grassroots organization that uh, collects churches and folks together, and goes into the political realm by asking for good things on God's behalf for the people of the metro area. Um, you've seen some uh, better explanations and longer explanations, surely, hopefully, about what it is that RISC is and does. And right now we've got a, a sign-up chart outside. We're looking to take a large group of folks into this annual thing that Risk does called the Nehemiah Action. Nehemiah was a prophet. And we're going to take a group of folks as large as we can for our first year to come back into it uh, to bear witness, to sit with other congregations, with other faithful people in the Richmond area to say, we believe in people having uh, good housing. We believe that people should be safe from gun violence, and we want to listen to our leadership, our political leadership in town and, and, and in the state, and we want to hear what they have to say about it. And we want to show up by way of saying, this is where our hearts are. As faithful people, this is, this is what we desire. If you have questions, uh, uh, Betty and Jenny, are our, our main leaders, uh, can answer more of your questions. There's, a, like I said, a table outside. Uh, you can check that out as well. But it will be a great and faithful event. I'm looking forward to going, and I hope, I hope you all can come along with us as well. Well, that's a lot <laughs> in that spirit of welcome and of God's grace on this good day. Let's stand and greet each other with the peace of Jesus Christ. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Good to see you. Peace be with you. Good to see you. <laughs> Hello again. Peace of Christ. Hmm. 
Well, as we gather ourselves to our places, I'll invite you to continue standing where you are as we come together for our call to worship this morning. Now we have your attention. With great rejoicing, we come to the house of the Lord today. God is our refuge and our stronghold. The power and love of God flow through this gathering. We place our whole trust in God's mighty compassion for us. Come, let us worship the Lord. Let us celebrate the presence of God here in this place. Christ is making himself known to us if we have ears to listen, if we have hearts that are open to what God is saying to us. We come to God with our whole selves in this prayer of confession, saying and admitting to God, we are sometimes closed off. We sometimes refuse to listen. We sometimes don't want to hear, and so we pray together. Merciful Lord, we like to think we do everything well. We pat ourselves on the back when we act with love and mercy toward others, complimenting ourselves in self-righteousness. But you know us better. You know our faults and failings. You know when we falsely proclaim that we are truly living as you would have us live. Teach us again about your forgiving and healing love. Show us ways to be merciful that we may extend to love and mercy that you have given us to others. Forgive us, we pray.
Through Christ we pray. Amen. Fear not, God is with us, stilling the storm and raging fears in our hearts. We place our trust in God, always. Amen. And invite Mr. Ben up for our worshiping by hand moment this morning. Well, it is good to be worshiping with you this morning. And uh, before we get into uh, worshiping by hand, we do have an opportunity. Our ushers are coming forward to collect the five cents a meal. Um, monthly offering, this goes to the hunger ministries uh, of, of our presbytery uh, and throughout the region, and um, they're going to be coming forward and collecting that as we uh, get ready for the word that God is speaking into our lives this morning. This is not something we, we do passively. We get to participate and get ready. We have some materials that help us to get ready, not just with our ears, but with our hands and our whole bodies, and I'm going to head over to the arts table, and any, uh, if you're a child or are feeling particularly childlike, you're welcome to, to join me and help me introduce the things that we're going to be uh, using today. Good morning. Now, before I forget, there's one thing that you maybe have noticed the last couple of weeks that I'm excited about. We do have some clipboards, which if ever you've ever tried to draw something on the pew cushions, it can be a little bit hard, and maybe you've had to use your neighbor's knee, uh, and you don't have to do that anymore because you can grab a clipboard. Um, but today, let's see. You've noticed a couple things. There's some paper. What else? There are some markers, crayons tape. Now, the tape is optional, and there's some pencils and scissors. Now, those sound all pretty regular. The main thing you're going to want today is this little template with little people outlines. That's in our email this week to, as well. And if you don't, if you want to freehand it, you can just grab a regular piece of paper. But you're going to want a few pieces of paper you're going to want scissors so you can cut things out, markers and crayons and pencils so you can draw, and then if you didn't have some already, you may want to grab some tape. That is a lot. Paper, scissors, markers and crayons, let us gather these things as we gather ourselves for worship. Today, we get to cut out and decorate some paper people. Any sheet of paper will work to start, but if you want, you can use a template like this to guide you. Cut your paper into slightly thinner sections. 
and then fold your paper like an accordion, switching over and under. Now we draw a person inside this rectangle, making sure that the hands and feet go all the way to the edge. We have a lot of paper to deal with here, but we only care about what's inside the outline of our person. We get to cut away everything else. As you cut out the surrounding paper, though, Pay attention to how you keep the connecting arms and legs intact, even as you separate those pieces and segments that aren't important. There's a story in the Bible about a time Jesus was sharing the news about God's love with some crowds in the synagogue when a woman came in to see him. She was bent over and because of an evil spirit, had been like that for a very long time. She could not stand up straight, but Jesus saw her like that, stretched out his hand, and healed her. She straightened up and started joyfully praising God. It was the Sabbath, though, and some leaders in the synagogue were upset about the woman being healed. Today's supposed to be all about God, they lectured. But Jesus looked past their unnecessary complaints and saw how the woman had been set free. Turns out the Sabbath was a good a time as any to share God's love. As we worship today, uncover the people on your paper by cutting away all your extra and unnecessary corners as we rely on the love of God to free us from all that is unnecessary in our lives. That was really wonderful. I had sometimes get lost in Ben's message <laughs> in a really wonderful way. Well, uh, speaking of Ben, and if you are here and if your children are here and they are between the ages of four years old and second grade, we invite them to meet at the back of the sanctuary to head downstairs for Children's Church as we continue in our uh, readings and in our, our stories. We will uh, be looking at that same passage from Luke, but also an expanded passage from Deuteronomy as well, ahead of our entry into this word of Scripture, I'll invite us all to bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, like children with running feet, let us come into your word today. Give us your understanding, your vision, your perception, your view of how the Spirit is bringing this message to us. In Christ we pray. Amen. So, yes, we're, so we're expanding a little bit. We're going into Deuteronomy as we're continuing our Sabbath series that we started last week. We're going to continue this all throughout Lent and uh, recapture some of the deep value and meaning and life shifting and altering things that celebrating Sabbath has for us. A lot of Sabbath words come from the Old Testament as that's the instructional place, the law-giving place that the Hebrew people turned to for thousands of years and that we still turn to today. So Deuteronomy 5, verses 12 through 14. This is the Lord speaking. It says, show respect for the Sabbath day. It belongs to me. You have six days when you can do your work, but the seventh day of the week belongs to me, your God. No one is to work on that day, not you, your children, your oxen or donkeys or any other animal, not even those foreigners who live in your towns and don't make your slaves do any work. We'll move forward into the New Testament 
reading from Luke chapter 13, 10 through 17, the same parable about the woman who was healed on the Sabbath. One Sabbath, while Jesus was teaching in a synagogue, a woman was there who had been crippled by an evil spirit for 18 years. She was completely bent over and could not straighten up. When Jesus saw the woman, he called her over and said, you are now well. He placed his hands on her, and at once she stood up straight and praised God. The man in charge of the synagogue was angry because Jesus had healed someone on the Sabbath. So he said to the people, each week has six days when we can work. Come and be healed on one of those days, but not on the Sabbath. The Lord replied, are you trying to fool someone? Won't any one of you untie your ox or donkey and lead it out to drink on a Sabbath? This woman belongs to the family of Abraham, but Satan has kept her bound for 18 years. Isn't it right to set her free on the Sabbath? Jesus' words made his enemies ashamed, but everyone else in the crowd was happy about the wonderful things he was doing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh, we're talking about the Sabbath, talking about what that means and how we can define it or celebrate it. It seems very clear, perhaps, to us that regular life encourages a life without rest. Now, I had some of our retired friends uh, come up to me after last week's service and say, I, I don't about, you know, we're, we're in a retired state of life, and I, I, I challenged them a little bit. I said, yes, but aren't you still busy? <laughs> Retirement also, often for us does not just mean a cessation from all work. <laughs> it only means a different kind of work that we take on. So we have regular life, we have this, this wide space, no matter what phase of, of life we're in, that somehow there is an inkling that we are encouraged to not rest. From a time uh, that we're responsible for our lives, or maybe even before that, maybe even in school and in college, we were implored to attain achievements because our future depends on it. What's your grade in math in fifth or sixth or seventh or fourth or third grade because it will affect the rest of your life? If you want things, and of course you want things, because look at the wonderful things that are available to you. If you want to have all these things in your life, you have to keep at this. You have to do more. You have to create more. If you're a creative person, you have to be about more. If you're not a creative person, you have to do this. You have to justify your existence on this earth. You have to constantly prove that you are worth something by what you make, by what you do, by the number of businesses that succeeded or failed because of you. We have to defend our lives. We have to defend every hobby that we take on. Well, I do this, but it's, it's, I don't do it very often, or I only do it at these times, or we're only traveling because of this. Every motion that we make. This is possibly a kind of disease, uh, or, or inversely, it, it, it's more of a disease to be labeled as lazy, the worst kind of leprosy that we could imagine, the thing that would make us untouchable in our society, to be named as someone who was seen as not wanting to work, or even worse, someone who was irrelevant to what the world does. That's a real retirement struggle. And conversations that I've had in 20 years of ministry with folks who hit that age of retirement and have a crisis of faith and identity and realize, I don't know what makes me relevant or needed or worthy 
anymore. We might not realize it, but we are being coerced by this world that doesn't just ignore a Sabbath moment, that doesn't just ignore what the Sabbath actually means, but instead this world is working actively against it at every turn. There's a woman by the name of uh, Tricia Hersey. In 2016, she was inspired by the kind of world that this is to create the nap ministry (laughs) that literally does nothing but encourage people to take naps, but says, rest is resistance. She kept it going through the pandemic, had a lot of interesting and wise words about how even though we were at home resting, our spirits were more troubled, more anxious, more worried than they'd ever been before, and we still needed that Sabbath moment. The idea of naps, Sabbath, all this whole philosophy goes against the notion that we create a value of worth and our own significance by doing. It it might even feel good when when we do that, when we follow that train of thought out, when we do all these different kinds of things, because we are creating a world of haves and haves nots. We're creating a world in which we are the doers and there are others who are not doers or who are less doers than we are, and so we are better. We get to feel superior. We have more than. And Sabbath intentionally breaks that feeling. This lesson in in Deuteronomy It's echoed in in a lot of other places, in Exodus and in in several other places where the law and the the Sabbath mandate crops up. Sabbath breaks the feeling of superiority. It increases and expands an understanding of equality. Because there's there's an expansion from the original uh, commandment list says this is how you celebrate Sabbath. It's you, and then immediately after it says your children, your work animals, your immigrants, your slaves. It it creates a, a, a philosophical argument on the Sabbath for people that are having trouble recognizing it. Number one, you have to have Sabbath for you. Okay, sure. I'm uh, already working so hard, and so I deserve a Sabbath, and so I, I should do that because it's, it's an equation. It's an equal equation. I've achieved enough to deserve a Sabbath, so okay, I'm there with you on that Bible. Go ahead. What's the next piece? Well, your children. Well, okay, we're back thousands and thousands of years. Uh, our children don't have the same status as us. Uh, we, we use them, and, and we ask them, and we increase their work because we depend on them for this agrarian culture, but okay, okay, I see they're part of my family. They should also get a Sabbath, I suppose. Well, also your animals. My animals. My animals don't care. A donkey doesn't care if it gets a, does it care if it gets a Sabbath? <laughs> All right, fine. Okay, God, you, you got me there. It's kind of silly, kind of funny, but we'll give our animals the day off too. Also the immigrants. Now, hang on, you mean this isn't just for our tribe? This isn't just for our group? This isn't just for the people that have earned your favor, Lord? This isn't just for the folks that you've especially blessed and said especially good things about all this time? It's for, it's for other people who just come into the country? They, I'm not even sure what they're doing or, or how hard they're working. All right, uh, fine. And also your slaves. Lord, those are the people expressly made in my life. I I, I got them. I paid for them expressly so that they could work when I didn't work. That's, That's their whole purpose in life is to make my life easier. That's why I bought them. That's why I paid for them. That's why I worked so hard to get the money that is their life. The Bible doesn't care. 
The Bible breaks the feelings of the world. It is a great equalizer. It says in this action, you're to use it as a story of how all people are equal, all people are deserving, all people are not tethered to what they do and what they achieve in order to earn something, all people are valued. Everyone, everything, every animal, every part of creation is intended by God to rest, to be made whole by it, to be restored by it, to be transformed by it. Because you can't take Sabbath as rest. You can't give Sabbath to God without changing the other six days of your life to make that ready to make that happen. It's also a special word to the owners in our society. People that have family and donkeys and who are around the immigrants or who own slaves. It's not talking to the slaves. (laughs) It's talking to the ones in power. It's talking to the ones who control whether or not someone else gets to take a Sabbath with their words or with their monetary support or with all the many things that we control. And it says, your power is given to you, is allowed to you in order to ensure that this rest pattern, that this Sabbath pattern is available to all. For their restoration. Can we do that? (laughs) Moses, if we walk down through the prophets of the Old Testament, Moses says people's hearts are hardened. He just got through with Pharaoh who had a hardened heart and he knows what a hardened heart looks like. And so he says people's hearts are so hard they're not going to be able to follow the law that you've put out for them, Lord. Ezekiel comes along behind him much later and says, well, the hearts of the people have to be softened. Jeremiah says that this is the point at which the obligation of following the law is to be replaced by the law being written deeply into your spirit so that following the law would no longer be a duty but will be a joyful way of living. Jeremiah sees the law transforming people. Isaiah says we can only do it with the Messiah at our side. Well, we can fast forward into our Luke passage and see how that went. <laughs> it's the same pattern again. This time it's, it's not oriented uh, by wealth or ownership of slaves. They've, they've crossed that river, but they have another one to still go on to. This separation is created by orthodoxy, by righteousness, by doing the right thing. I had an old pastor of mine that was uh, with me in uh, the beginning parts of my ministry. His name was Reverend Doug Height, and Reverend Doug Height always used to say, there's no righteousness like (laughs) self-righteousness. That's what this is. The rabbis and the Pharisees, the, the people of this synagogue saying, how dare you? This is way out of line of what we know to be what God has said we should do. They're serving the same un-Sabbath system that people were before under a different name. Ignoring what the Sabbath actually means. Ignoring the restoration that is intended. The transformation that is supposed to be there. Instead of producing more and more, they have divided themselves on who is better, who is more righteous or more holy or more wonderful, destroying the equity that Sabbath is meant to create. This passage that we read 
the end of it, it says that, that the people, the, the, the enemies of Jesus, which I, I think is, is incredible to think of, that Jesus is in the synagogue, in the place of faith, and there are already these encampments who hear and can't hear at the same time. It says that when Jesus speaks about what the Sabbath is supposed to be, about the restoration that this woman is experiencing, those there were ashamed. The Greek tie into that is a preposition and the word for disfigurement, which I think is more the, the root of what this ashamed uh, English word is trying to get us to imagine. Because what is, what is it when a creature that is made in the image of a loving Sabbath God is doing terrible, hurtful things to the people of their own church. They're disfiguring that image in which they were made. Sabbath isn't just rest. <laughs> it's a nap as resistance to the world. It reimagines our social lives. It fixes our disfigurements and invites us to return to the image of the Creator. We're always tempted to acquire, to work endlessly, to create divisions that say we are better than, but our worth together is only found when the drive to acquire is broken. Only then are we free together on the Sabbath. Only then are we free to be who we are made to be. I won't fight, I won't strive, but I'll lean all my life on you. You take the pressure off my shoulders, you make my soul a little lighter. In a world in a rush, I will rest and I'll trust in you. You are the still, still waters to my soul. I will rest in your love. I will be still and know you're in control. I will rest in your love. Take the world right off my shoulders When I'm anxious, you're the solace In the face of my fears, I will cast all my cares on you You are the
Participating in this life, being the people that we are intended to be, requires trust. So I'll invite you to stand as we say what it is that we believe and who it is that we trust in our life of faith. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed, and blessing the children, healing the sick, and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with the outcasts, forgiving sinners, calling all to repent and believe the gospel, unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition. Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain, and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Amen. I'll invite you to be seated. As we can join together in a time and space of being fed together to a time and space of sharing something quiet and restful. There is a muddled amount of work that we do on our Sabbaths. In your report, there were a number of human work hours that go into creating this worshipful moment for all of us. Thousands of hours each year, hundreds each week. So it seems a little odd to talk about rest when a lot of us are working so hard. Which is why... The idea is not about necessarily a day or a marker or a 24-hour period, sunset to sunset. It is about who we are. It's about our identity. It's about how we bring ourselves into this communion, how we bring ourselves into this place, how we ready and prepare ourselves, how we create room for rest in our lives and in the lives of everyone that we touch, that we control, that we oversee. So in that spirit, we are invited to come to this table today, a table that was blessed by Christ's work and sacrifice and amazing and incredible grace. A grace that was unknown to the first people who sat at this table. A grace that Christ taught them to understand as He took the bread that was on the table, broke it, and gave blessing over it. Telling them a new and different story, saying, this is my body that has been broken for you. In the same way, he took the wine that was on the table, poured it out, 
gave thanks over it and told them. The story of this cup is a cup of salvation, a cup that frees you out of the spaces that you were and brings you into a new space of freedom, joy, and love. So in that, in that space, we are invited today. We'll follow our practice. I'll invite my, my worship folks up to the front, and we'll follow our uh, early morning uh, church practice, which is to have here in the center an offering of the bread. And if you are good with taking bread from my hands, you maybe saw me give them a, a spray with some, some uh, sanitizer. If you're ready for that, please come. Uh, just We'll go back and forth in the middle here. And if you're not, the wafers are there with the cups as well. And that is also our gluten-free option today. So as people who are ready to receive the fullness of Christ, I invite you to stand, come down the middle, and just let's eat together.
the thing that completes this meal in the way we celebrate it is our prayer, our going back to God in great thanksgiving. And, and we often are matching our prayers or, or listening to each other in our ministry meetings and our gatherings about who has a joy or a concern to share with the group. This is a, a church of great sharing together. There are ways to do that digitally if you're watching from home, and there are certainly ways to do that here. There's a, a contact card that looks like this in front of you if you want to drop something into the plate. But for those who are here in person and want to share something with the group, we are glad and willing to hear words from the, the floor on prayers or concerns, joys that we want to share with one another as we pray. Glad to have Rachel and family visiting. Absolutely. Yeah, good to see y'all. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, others, yeah. Oh, 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 it's celebrating your birthday. Yes, we heard about this, this double birthday that's happening here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We were praying for Elizabeth Wood over at MCV uh, as of, I think, 1 a.m. last night or, or the past couple nights. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Okay. And her name? Betty. Betty, who's, who's fallen and broken her hip. Uh, prayers for her. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Others today. Yes, thank you, Sue. Uh, Wade Habush, many of you know, uh, passed away. We're at, at the anniversary, and at those anniversaries, as we know, are always difficult and hard for us um, to remember and to think. So, yeah, thank you for sharing that with us, and you know that we join you in missing, in missing Wade as well. Yeah, thank you. Others today. With these things and, and more in our hearts, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Lord, you do bring us into this incredible system of love, this incredible uh, place of love just because you made us, just because you created us, just because we belong to you in the same way that the world belongs to you. All of creation belongs to you. You remind us that this Sabbath also is yours. It isn't a question of if we can celebrate it, but will we keep that lesson in our hearts? As we have shared in the meal today, a meal of great grace, we give you our thanksgiving for giving us these rhythms, for helping us understand that work and rest, that equality and being together as one people are the way we were made to be, the intention of your will on earth. Hear our prayer too as we ask for your, for your intercession on our health, on our wellness, on our grief, Lord, on our worry and our concern. Fold them into our trust of you. Give us good courage to participate and to be in this life that you have created lovingly for us. Bring us closer into your will, into this wonderful expression of rest and all that it holds as resistance from a world that is sick and broken, Lord. We bring to you our whole selves. Bless us. Give us your peace. And continue to train us in the way of your Son, Jesus Christ, whom we follow as disciples. 
in whose name we pray and in whose way we pray together, saying these words, Our Father, who is in heaven, blessed is your holy name. We pray your kingdom comes and that your good will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As a reflection of our joy and of who we are, we have this place in our worship to give of ourselves, our tithes, our offerings. And so I invite you, whether you're giving digitally or annually or every week, all our blessings, all our gifts are unto God and blessed here together as we worship. I invite you to give as you've been led to give today. Lord, we bring our whole selves, we bring everything that we are, and we bring these, our gifts, our tithes, our offerings to you, to be used for your good work in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing together our closing hymn.
an easy mark to just relax and, and be in Sabbath. It is a way that we have of interacting with the world, of making sure that not only we are reflecting the image of a God who loves us, but that we are resisting and reflecting the actions of that same Lord, the actions of a Christ who wants us to be restored on this day. So as people who have been restored by meal and by word, I invite you to go out into the world and to be people of the Sabbath. Amen.